Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 15th of November 2022. Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanks very much for having uh, you on the show uh, tonight. It's great that you've found your way here and a very important conversation. Interestingly, I scheduled this show with, with Adam quite a few weeks ago. So I must have known something about what group was going to be happening in the crypto land, but uh, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Of course, there'll be plenty of time for you to ask questions as well as uh, the discussion that I've planned with, with Adam. Before I go any further, let me just uh, say we don't provide specific financial or legal advice on the channel here. It's a general conversation only. Uh, the chat is moderated, but I do encourage you to uh, share your views and opinions in the chat. Always really worth uh, seeing what goes on there. I don't necessarily follow every line of discussion simply because there are too many going on at any one time. For those watching in replay, this is at the 15th of November 2022. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, and I encourage you to ask questions, do use at Walk the World. That'll get it into my queue so I can see it. So use at Walk the World. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question to the top of the list and indeed make a contribution to what we do here, which will be greatly appreciated. Anyway, without uh, further waffle from me, I think it's time to bring Adam in. So let me push this button. Adam, hello. Hello, Martin. Good to see you. Great. Thanks very much for coming back on once again. And uh, we do seem to time our conversations quite well, don't we, given the ups and downs and the downs and downs of crypto? It's funny, Martin. Um, there's about three shows we did where I was on the upside and this one on the downside, I'm thinking... Geez, this is going to be a tough one because it has been a very rough week in crypto indeed. Arguably, we believe in the crypto land, this has actually been the hardest week that we've had because we've seen other big downfalls in the past that we recovered from quite quickly. You might look at the Celsius saga, the Terra Luna crash. Going back in the last cycle, we had BitConnect, but that was very, um, very different to what we're experiencing now. But of course, with the fall of FTX, the second biggest trading platform in the world, depending on what data set you're going on, but arguably the second biggest uh, trading platform in the world, it's gone down and it's taking a lot of uh, players, both institutional and retail with it. Yeah, and uh, look, there's a whole bunch of things I want to explore. But the first question I've got for you is, when we talk about an exchange, let's be clear about what we're talking about, right? Because I think some people have been quite confused by, by, by what's going on. There are two elements that I see. The first is that an exchange is where you effectively can convert you know, a cryptocurrency into another cryptocurrency or a cryptocurrency into dollars or whatever you want, right? And you can buy and sell them. The second, though, is that some of the exchanges have created their own coins, and so they then issue those coins and get other people to buy them. And so they create value, quote, unquote, which actually then turns into something which they can then monetize themselves. So those two functions seem to me to have got quite scrambled. And that's part of the reason why we've got some of the mess that we've got at the moment. Yeah, arguably three functions. So you've got cryptocurrency itself. Uh, and even within that, you've got true cryptos and digital currencies that we'll talk about a little bit later. But you're right, you've got the exchange. And think of an exchange as a shop. You simply walk in with one product and you exchange it for another product. In traditional senses, we walk into a supermarket with a dollar. We exchange that dollar for a bottle of milk. But on exchanges in the crypto land, we walk into an exchange digitally and we exchange fiat currency for whichever crypto we want. And then once we're in that exchange, we can exchange it again, exchanging a crypto for a crypto or getting out of the crypto land by exchanging it back into dollars and cents or whichever fiat you're part of out there in the wild western world or the entire fiat world where it's all starting to fall to pieces outside of crypto. But then you're right, there's this third component where these these platforms, these exchanges, build their own native token. Now, it, it should be noted that not all exchanges do this. For example, uh, no affiliation, but Australia's biggest uh, trading platform or exchange is CoinSpot. And CoinSpot has been around for 10 years. It's it had audits, it's solvent, it's not affected by this mess. It's got over 2 million users and it does not have a native token. So it does not, there is no such thing as a coin spot token. So to make the distinction, just because you have an exchange doesn't mean that you need your own native token. But you're right, there are some exchanges that in fact go in there and say, well, hang on a second, we can make an exchange, but we could also make our own native token. And 
in previous discussions, Martin, I've explained to you and the viewers on my own channel as well that if you look at the financial system over the last 200 years, everything that we've done in the traditional financial sector, we're now doing that in the crypto land instead of over 200 years, but over 200 months. And I would argue that what's happened recently is probably the equivalent to the Lehman Brothers 2008 global financial crisis, where you had centralized bodies lending out money that they never really had making up some type of token or note or bond or something that said, hey, we're good for this money. It's okay. Invest with us. Then people come into Lehman Brothers or the banking system or FTX. They, they give these institutions, these centralized, arguably corrupt or broken bodies, their money. And then those centralized bodies take that money and they don't do what they were supposed to do, which was essentially hold that money and keep it safe. What they do instead is they take that money and they invest it into other assets or other industries to try and get some type of return. Ultimately, what happened uh, either in the FTX example or the Lehman Brothers, they were lending out money that they never had. They were writing notes against value that wasn't really true. And in the end, the house of cards fell down. And the reason why FTX is hurting everyone in the crypto land is because, as I mentioned, it was the second biggest platform. And it wasn't just a case of retail investors going in there and saying, I'm going to buy some crypto and leave with that crypto. What they were doing is they were going into the exchange and they were buying the crypto and leaving it on the exchange, which goes against the rules of trading in crypto. You want to use an exchange, not as a bank, not as a digital wallet, not as a safety deposit box, but rather an exchange. You are meant to go in there, swap fiat for crypto and take your crypto out and custody it yourself. Because we're lazy as human beings and we're scared of custodying our own money and we're used to banks, many people are treating these financial systems or these exchanges as traditional financial systems. They go into the exchange, they treat it as a bank, they leave their money in the bank, whether that's in fiat or digital form or crypto form, and instead of custodying it themselves, they leave it there. And then what happens is the second part to that is corrupt, insolvent, incompetent, I'll let the viewers decide which it was, these bad players who are then custodying this money and in control of it, they do bad things with it. They either run off with it and go to Mexico figuratively, they put it into other high risk assets, they lend it out to people who could never repay those debts. And eventually when it's all exposed and the tide rolls out, we see who's standing there without any swimming trunks on. We saw it in the 2008 global financial crisis. And I argue we are now seeing it in the 2022 FTX crypto crisis. Yeah, and that's an important observation, isn't it? That you know, the, the speed of, of of traffic is is much faster than in, in the old-fashioned world. But some of the same human behaviours, <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing the same human greed and all, all those things, right? And and that's because, of course, you know, humans are you know, well, they're greedy. <laughs> um, and and one of the interesting observations also is that we know that. Some individual retail investors are caught up in this, but we also know that a significant number of hedge funds, large financial institutions and even banks are caught up with this. And one of the concerns that is being expressed now is this could filter over not just out in crypto land, but out into the you know, more normal financial system because a lot of those players are also playing in the normal finance sector too. And so as they write down or write off their exposures, they're going to take real hits. Yeah, absolutely. So exactly the same with the 2008 global financial crisis. What happened is you had all these banks cross collateralized, lending money to each other, saying that we're good for it, having like these bonds or IOUs or some type of paper or contract to say, we're good for it. We trust you. We're all lending against each other. We're all investing in one another. And then when one fell down, they all fell down. What's different this time in the crypto land is that we used to see banks and crypto as two separate worlds. We never saw them as one financial institution or market per se. There was the fiat and traditional markets or the trad trades as they call them, the traditional traders. And then you had the crypto goers, which were in a different world. What's happened is because crypto is moving so fast and crypto is not broken, crypto by no means is broken. As you just mentioned, the issue is people. The, the code is not broken. Mathematics is not broken. The blockchain is not broken. Everything is still sound. Where it went wrong is we started treating crypto like banks. And we know 
from over 200 years of financial history and beyond that fiat always collapses. And we know that banks have gone down and have been bailed out in the past with our tax dollars and now will be bailed in with our savings. So what's happened is something that was pure, which was a mathematical code that is crypto, it, it trickled over to the traditional financial sector. The traditional financial sector, they had to invest in it because there's just too much money to be made. There is so much money in these markets they had to put some money into it. Now, I don't know of any financial, traditional financial institution that's gone all in, but most certainly when it comes to other crypto exchanges or other crypto platforms, whether it's lending platforms, exchanges, or some type of business, a lot of them did put big money into FTX, but they broke their own rules. They broke the rules of not treating an exchange as an exchange. They started treating an exchange as a bank. And once that bank was playing rules of the olden day banks, it was destined to fail. Another thing that's interesting is that the CEO, Sam Bankman Freed, which has now got the name Scam Bankrupt Fraud, this young kid who was uh, basically a billionaire, he had about, I think, $29 billion last week and now has less than $1 billion and is allegedly on the run in Argentina. It's very difficult to substantiate this other than he was a multi, multi, multi billionaire and now he's pretty much broke and a lot of people are after him. What was interesting, Martin, is that we saw Sam Bankman Freed coming out to the traditional media and lobbying for regulations on crypto. And now this is very big. It's big because he was not a representative of the crypto space. Sure, he had a lot of money, but he was like a new kid on the block that suddenly, and he came from a very rich background. So he wasn't one of these kids who just started playing on a computer and went from rags to riches. He went from riches to mega riches. And allegedly, or evidently, well, I'll let the viewers do their own research on this, but it's out there. He was sponsoring, uh, or donating, I should say, the Democratic Party. And it, chance or coincidence, Martin, during the midterm elections, when it all sort of came to light, it was the same time almost to the hour that FTX collapsed. So you have this rich kid lobbying government to put traditional regulations on a new financial sector. And at the same time, that same government of which he was sponsoring was losing seats in the Senate and the House. And then the whole House of Cards came falling down. In the meantime, what was also happening concurrently, and this is why it's quite an interesting drama, is Binance, which is the biggest platform in the world, the biggest exchange in the world, and it does more than exchanging. It, it does a lot of things. It's a very powerful tool. There was bad blood between Shang Zheng Pao, which is, we call him CZ. CZ is the CEO of Binance, and you had SBF, which is the CEO of FTX. There was bad blood between these two players. And ultimately, a week, about a week before FTX collapsed, Binance sold about half a billion dollars worth of FTT tokens. FTT is the native token to the FTX platform. A lot of uh, letters here, I realize, but just think of, you've got one young kid who owns FTX. You've got arguably an older kid who owns Binance. Binance is the biggest. FTX is the second biggest. FTX is donating to political parties at the same time the leader of that political of that political party of that F, of that trading platform is going forward into the media and speaking on behalf of all crypto commentators say or, or and crypto enthusiasts saying these are the regulations that we need to put in the crypto space so even before this went down Martin many of the experienced crypto commentators goers investors developers they all had a problem with Sam Bankman Freed because he was communicating on behalf of the crypto land, but not in a language or with a message that we supported. So there are many moving parts to this, but ultimately I bring it down to this, just to wrap it all up. The reason why FTX failed is because it was operating in market failure. Crypto didn't fail. What failed was a centralized body that was acting with, with the same corrupt principles and the same questionable practices that banks have been operating in. And ultimately, the FTX crash of 2022 is almost identical, with a few variations, to the global financial crisis of 2008 that was triggered by Lehman Brothers. Yeah, so there are some frightening parallels, <laughs> not least because, you know, you didn't know what, what was inside the package, you opened the package and it wasn't what you thought it was, right? That, that's, exactly. That's yeah. one, of, one of the things that comes up again and again. But he, here's a question for you. Quite a few people, I made a show about a week ago when this was in flight and happening, 
And quite a few people said to me, no, 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 you, you don't understand. Bitcoin isn't crypto. Crypto isn't Bitcoin, right? These are, these, are, these are like chalk and cheese, so don't get the two confused. You can't really say there's a problem with Bitcoin. You know, it's over there. Help me unpack that, will you? That statement is completely correct. There is Bitcoin and then there is everything else. Bitcoin, the reason why Bitcoin is so powerful is because it's just a mathematical code. So there's currently 21,000, from the data I can see, there's 21,170 different cryptocurrencies. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's only one Bitcoin and then there's everything else. And arguably the only two true cryptocurrencies in, it, in their essence is Bitcoin and Litecoin. Don't worry about Litecoin at the moment. Let's just talk about Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin so different? There is no Bitcoin company. There is no Bitcoin CEO. There is no Bitcoin bank. There's no Bitcoin exchange. In fact, Martin, there isn't even any Bitcoin. It's just a decentralized ledger that says there are 21 million Bitcoin that will only ever exist. These is how, this is the pro process to get them in existence. And this is the process to do a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Immutable, borderless, censorship resistant, open, neutral. No one can touch Bitcoin. And the, C, the SEC admits it themselves. So the SEC, as an example at the moment, are going after Ripple Labs and their token is XRP. Now, many who love XRP say that XRP is going to replace the SWIFT network and be the, the, the global currency of the future. Maybe not as a reserve currency, but certainly the way of moving money around the world. There's many different opinions on this. But ultimately, if the SEC had an issue with Bitcoin, there's no one to sue. It's like trying to sue air. I mean, it's everywhere, but there's, there's no air company per se. I can't even really give an exact analogy of this because it's such an advanced technology. We've never had anything like this in the history of humanity. Now, of course, my biases are this. I'm all for Bitcoin because it is truly the hardest money we've ever had. And even if people say gold is harder, when we talk about hard money, it's not that it's hard that you can tap it and it's physically hard. It's that it's it's hard to produce, and that's what mining is with Bitcoin. It's hard to be fraudulent, and you can't do that with Bitcoin. But it's also a hard money in the sense that it's got a set supply. Now, if you might, if you say gold has got a set supply, we know that there's about two Olympic-sized swimming pools of gold that we know of that have been mined out of the ground at the moment. If we, were we, if we were to double that supply through some type of exploration or discovery, that would throw off the gold markets entirely. Bringing it back to crypto, with Bitcoin, we know how many there are. There's 21 million. That's it. Now we look at the other 21,000 and X cryptocurrencies. A cryptocurrency can be made overnight. Now, they're not even true cryptocurrencies. We call them digital assets or tokens. Or uh, some people do call them cryptos, but in their essence, they're just digital currencies. Now, and what does that mean? That means a company comes along, a person. Now, of course, there was someone behind Bitcoin, but we don't know who it is. It went through a synonym a pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. And Satoshi Nakamoto, is it a him, her, or they? No one knows because they're missing. We, we can't find them. And that's, that's perfect. It's perfect because we don't know who they are. There's no one to sue. There's no one to, who wants to sue us. So for example, if I call myself Adam Stokes Bitcoin, there's no company that's going to come and sue me because Bitcoin is owned by no one except for everyone. And again, that, that is very unique. We've never had that. When we look at digital assets, there's nothing stopping me tonight, and this will happen in the future, it's already happening right now. There's nothing happen there's no nothing stopping me, just as there's nothing stopping me from making a web page that says this web page has these words. That's the internet of information. We now have the internet of money, where there's nothing stopping me making a coin called Adam Stokes coin. The supply is a billion or a hundred billion or a quintillion, and there is a coin out there that has a quintillion coins. There's nothing stopping any of us doing that. Now, of course, everyone goes, well, if everyone can make a coin, why does it have any value? It's all fake. It's all digital. Again, it goes back to the essence. There is only one Bitcoin. And how much is a Bitcoin worth? It's worth 16,500 US dollars at time of recording. And why is it worth 16,500 US dollars? It's because that's what the market says it's worth. Now, for another coin, like Dogecoin as an example, because most people know of that, why is Dogecoin worth eight cents? It's worth eight cents because that's what the market says it's worth. So it's the essence of democracy when we have a money that is by the people, for the people, and determined in value by the people. If you and I want to use Dogecoin, 
that can be our prerogative. But if you're doing business with me, I choose Bitcoin. And evidently, and I can prove it through the price, the volume, the history, and everything around Bitcoin, the number one coin in crypto is Bitcoin. Why? No one owns it. Everyone has access to it. Immutable, open source, neutral, censorship resistance, with no one who can make more of it or take it away. You could lose it, which is good for the value for everyone else. But unlike every other coin, where they can print more, reduce the supply, increase the supply, uh, there's a company that can be sued, Bitcoin stands alone. That's not to say that other coins won't do other things. So now I have to make another distinction. Bitcoin is not just a store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. That's only one component of Bitcoin. It is all of those things, but it is also a global financial system. For example, what is the internet? If you think of the internet of knowledge, the internet of knowledge is this thing that you can't kind of touch. Sure, there's servers and nodes and web developers. You can touch those things and you can touch cables, but the internet itself, the internet of knowledge is kind of this metaphoric weird thing that if you try to explain it to someone 50 years ago, they would think you're absolutely mad. But now we can't live without the internet of knowledge because it's in all facets of life. What we've now created, leveraging upon the internet of knowledge, is the internet of value or the internet of money. And what Bitcoin has created is the most secure payment system in the history of humanity. We have never had a, a decentralized financial system like this ever. Now, if you wanna think of it in physical terms, when we put gold in a vault, that was a centralized area where someone could break into that vault and steal that money. When you think of digital money, we have these silos of information, a server as an example, where someone can can hack into that server and get into this centralized piece of information where they can steal that information. And we've seen that recently, of course, with the Optus hack, where we've lost all of this information. And we've also seen it with the Medibank private hack, where we've lost all of this information. The reason why those systems fail when it comes to knowledge or, inf or money is because they are centralized silos. Bitcoin, beyond being a medium of exchange unit of account, is also, and a store of value, is also decentralized in the way it's st stored. What does that mean? That means that no one can break into a Bitcoin bank or a Bitcoin vault and steal it because the, the storage of Bitcoin, if you will, which is on a ledger, is essentially limitless. It's everywhere. It's on my computer. It's in outer space. It's on a million other computers. And if you try and break into my computer and steal the Adam Stokes Bitcoin ledger, well, guess what? There's over a million other copies that say, no, that person who just said that they own that Bitcoin that was on Adam Stokes' ledger, there's a million other copies of that ledger that say that, that is not, that's not true. So what does this mean? It means that besides Bitcoin being this coin, this thing that goes up and down in value, it's in fact the most global, it's the most secure global network that we've ever had. And what does that mean? That means that it's not just about Bitcoin, it's about building other things on top of Bitcoin. And that is why it is so powerful. And even when we've had a centralized collapse like we have with FTX, Bitcoin's not affected, Bitcoin is not broken. Now, when we look at FTT as an example, FTT is another digital currency. It's a digital currency that was made by FTX. So FTX is a platform and FTX said, we're gonna make our own digital currency called FTT. Well, we can see that collapsed, but Bitcoin didn't. Bitcoin is still holding fast, but where people got hurt with Bitcoin is that they stored their keys, their private keys to their own Bitcoin with FTX. So when FTX collapsed, just like if a bank collapsed and you put your money in that bank, they've lost control of it. But the power with Bitcoin is you have the ability to hold the private keys, or in another words, hold the digital file. It's not exactly what's happening. You're just holding the private keys to the ledger, which is everywhere. When you're in control of that, no one can take it. Sure, they might be able to take it through threatening you or torturing you to give up your private seed phrase. But beyond that, no government, no hacker, no one can, st can take your Bitcoin, unlike we can see with the traditional financial system that if a bank wants to take your money, they can, they can just stop block your account. If a government wants to take your money, they can just go to the bank and say, that guy owes us money, give it to us. But with Bitcoin, no one can touch it. With digital currencies, 
if you go to the CEO of that company and you're the government or a military or a police or so forth, and you say, give me the keys to that person's money, then it can be compromised. And one question which um, a couple of people in the chat asked as you were talking there was, well, if Bitcoin is so immutable and, and distinct and different from the rest of crypto, why has the value of Bitcoin dropped so dramatically? First part. And second part is what's the cost of mining versus the current value? Is it still economical to mine it? Uh, so two parts. So I'll do the easy one first. Yes, it's, it's cheaper to mine a coin than what the value is worth. And even if it weren't, there are still a lot of people out there who don't pay electricity. You know, I mean, what do you mean you don't pay electricity? There's a lot of free electricity out there. You might look at uh, flaring gas. You might look at certain um, electrical power plants that they, they have excess energy that is sometimes not used. Therefore, there's these huge crypto mining farms, these big Bitcoin mining farms that are working in partnership with these massive power providers and saying, look, we'll make use of your excess energy that you were just going to flare figuratively or literally into thin air, but we want a massive discount on that electricity. Now, it's a win-win for everyone because the miners get cheap electricity and the electricity companies, instead of just having this electricity go into no man's land, they can actually gain some money for it. Now, the, the other part of the question is, you know, why did crypto drop? Well, it's because it's a reflect, why did Bitcoin drop specifically? It's because at the moment, there's, we're going into a global depression and many people are hurting outside of crypto. We can see inflation is out of control. People are losing their jobs. The real estate market is in pain. Uh, people are hurting for money and some people need to sell money. So that's one part of it. People are selling because they actually need the money to, to do something with. The other half of it is just like any other market anywhere, when markets are made up of people, people are made up of emotions. Emotion leads to actions. Those actions lead to a buy or sell. At the moment, there's a lot of, if you will, unconfidence or a lack of confidence in the crypto markets. And we've seen this before. We see it in all markets. It's just that it moves so much quicker in crypto because there's smaller market caps. People were spooked by what happened with FTX and they sold their positions, not just in FTT and every, all other coins, but they dumped some of their Bitcoin holdings. But I remind the viewers, 10 years ago, Bitcoin was a hundred bucks. Bitcoin is now sixteen and a half thousand dollars. So you know, I was I dealt with this just this morning. I walked past a colleague and they said, "Oh, has Bitcoin recovered?" And I said, "Recovered from when?" And he goes, "Well, over the last five days." And I'm like, "You're worried about five days? I'm up over a million percent over the last ten years, half a million percent over the last five years." So if you look, if you extrapolate this out over to a long time period. This is nothing. It is absolutely nothing. Now, of course, if you invert it, even if you don't like crypto, that's okay. Go to Warren Buffett. What does Warren Buffett say to do when a market pulls back? Do you buy a top or do you buy a bottom? When's the best time to buy? When there's blood on the streets or when everyone's in euphoric stage? So those who understand crypto, and we saw this, when, when everyone was dumping their positions and FTX was liquidating its positions, because FTX had a lot of holdings, they needed money quickly, so they liquidated a lot of their crypto assets, that dropped the price down. But then people like me and my company and retail investors and nations and big banks and those who know what's going on, they came in and they bought some crypto. And that's why we found a price bottom. It did drop just to the 15,900 US dollar mark, but immediately that found a line of support and it had immediately picked up. Sure, it's not at this all-time high of 62,000 US dollars when everything was good on the global financial stage, but it's nowhere near its all-time low of zero when it was first created. Yeah, and the interesting observation there is if you track the movement of Bitcoin, it does quite often mirror now the normal market. You know, look at the, uh, you know, the ASX or the or the, the Dow or the S&P 500, right? It's sort of more tracking that now than it used to, right? And that, that goes back to exactly what we are talking about before, yep. is that <clears throat> th these, these worlds have come together, but they will decouple. Now, not financial advice, just my opinion, but I live in this space. And I'm telling you that we are going into a global depression and fiat is about to collapse like there is no other collapse that you've ever seen. It is a matter of economic history and mathematical fact. We are going into a global depression. Don't worry about Bitcoin. But yes, at the moment, they have married up. It, we are in the everything bubble. In fact, if you take pretty much all the markets and you line them up and you track them together, they're all working in unison. Now, I know some of you are saying, oh, hang on, Adam, what about the DXY? No, 
the DXY is just mirrored against everything else. And um, it's not that uh, the US dollar is going up, it's that everything else around it is going down. And I can prove this. Ask the people in the United States, is their dollar in America buying them a lot more stuff? And the answer is no. It's inflation is out of control. It's just that as all the other dominoes of fiat fall down and the whole global economy collapses, the gap between the US dollar and all other fake money, which is fiat globally, that's getting bigger. But when, it, when the house of cards outside of crypto collapses, where are you going to put your money? And if you think the global reserve is going to be gold, that's what got us to fiat in the first place. Now, I like gold. I've got gold and I've got no problem with gold, but I can't use gold on Amazon. I can't use gold at the shops. So I can't use gold in a physical form to go buy a loaf of bread. And I can't use gold as a digital form to buy something off Amazon. And everything that goes digital is arguably better because even governments are moving digital themselves, whether it's a fiat or a true cryptocurrency. So ultimately, we're about to see a global financial crisis crisis and collapse like no other. It's going to make the 2008 global financial crisis of, of the past look like a joke. What, we're, what is about to happen in the world, according to me and my research, is that when the US dollar collapses, and it will collapse because it's already collapsing, all fiats are collapsing, it's just that the USD will be the last one to go. There will be a gap. And we are looking for a new global reserve. Now, any country, whether it's China, Russia, Australia, India, these superpowers, they want to be the global reserve currency. But then what are we back to? We're back to another fiat. And the problem with fiat is that it's linked to nothing and it's unlimited and it is subjected or inevitably it's going to face inflation. So the, the real issue at the moment is not what's the issue with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has proven itself. And you say, well, it's only been around for 13 years. Well, look what it's done in 13 years compared to all other currencies. All other currencies around the world, including gold, if you want to call it a currency, in real value, don't worry about nominal amounts, but in real value, they have all gone down. Bitcoin has done the complete opposite. It's We are in this transitionary phase at the moment. They were first working apart. They're now sort of going across each other, and then they will decouple again. And when they decouple again and fiat collapses everywhere, the question is, where do you put your money? Are you going to put it in real estate? Well, that's not very mobile and it's got a lot of issues around it. Are you going to put it in gold? Well, what's the supply of gold? Questionable. Are you going to put it into another fiat? Well, it's your choice, but would you do that? Are you going to put it in negative yielding bonds? Are you going to put it into a, fa a falling stock market that is controlled by humans? Or are you going to put it into an immutable, open source, decentralized mathematical code that has proven itself as a store of value, value, medium of exchange and unit of account, and the most secure global payment system in the history of humanity, I know where I'm putting my money. Sure, I'm not going all in, but most certainly, the best bet at the moment is still Bitcoin. So let's sort of move the conversation a little bit further forward insofar that um, we know that a lot of central banks have been very vocal about the risks of crypto and Bitcoin, they put both of them in the same bucket. They don't have the same distinction that you've you, you've made, right? And they're basically saying um, it's risky. You know, it's there's no value. Blah 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 blah, right? And so, so that line of argument has been made for the last couple of years by many central bankers and uh, other hangers-on. And then they've started their own programs of a central bank digital currency, right? And last count, there are 81 central banks around the world now piloting central bank digital currencies in opposition to the crypto Bitcoin axis. Right? And what they're arguing is you've got to have control. You've got to have, you know, the same checks and balances that you have for the way that the current monetary system works. And so what we're doing is effectively creating a digital Aussie dollar or whatever, right? Um, so my question to you is, this wave of central bank digital currency experiments, which are at various gestations, and we can talk about that shortly, do you think it's in direct reaction to what happened through the crypto wave? Are they trying to get their hands on, you know, the crypto or are they basically trying to say, no, forget crypto, we've got a better alternative for you? 
Uh, a great question, and, and I'm glad you raise it. How ironic that banks have the moral high ground to, to tell us how well money works. Look at how they break money. And of course they hate Bitcoin. They have never, ever had a competitor. There has been no competitor to the fake, useless, corrupt money that is feared until now. And they will do everything in their power to stop Bitcoin because they know it's all over for them. They know that fractional reserve lending, inflation, the money printing machine, lending out money that they never had and then charging you interest on it, and then being bailed out when it all falls to pieces by the government's taxes taken from the people or the government's law that the, the money can be taken from the people's savings account. I'm screaming to the people saying, why are you trusting banks? Look at the mess that they've made. They erode your money. And I'm not talking about stealing fees from your bank account. I'm talking about printing money and diluting your money every year in the natural rate, so-called natural rate of inflation. When I did my economics degree, I thought inflation was natural. When I learned about money for in its real essence through Bitcoin, it's like, why is, why is inflation natural? Inflation, now, even if you don't want to believe me, listen to one of the greatest economists in the world, who he will tell you, rest his soul, that inflation isn't from supply and demand. Inflation is a government-made phenomenon from printing money. And banks print money through fractional reserve lending. But of course, they point fingers at each other. The banks say, well, it's not us. You've got to speak to the government because they're in charge because they run the, the, the laws. And the government say, well, it's not us, it's the banks because they're printing the money. Go take it up with them. And we've got a reserve bank or a, a federal reserve, which is neither a federal entity nor has any reserves of money. So as people, we need to really say, if it didn't work a thousand years ago with every other empire in history, if it didn't work during the 2008 global financial crisis or the Great Depression or any other part in history where we just keep printing this money, diluting everyone's money, why on earth would it work now? So the first half is, why are you trusting banks? Why, and I don't mean you, Martin, I'm talking to everyone metaphorically here, why are you trusting an entity that can take your money, block your money, seize your money, lend out your money, lend you money that they never had, then charge you interest on that money, therefore diluting everyone's money in the process, then get protection from governments through bail-in or bail-out laws, so when they operate in market failure, which they are, and it all falls to pieces, which it is, and then it all collapses, which it will, why are we supporting that system? We now have an alternative, which is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, it may have a funny name, we may not understand it because we've never had anything like it in the history of our existence, but it works. It is mathematically sound. And it doesn't matter if you like it or I like it. The reason why governments hate it, it's not, probably not so much governments, maybe to an extent, but banks, is because their monopoly on money is over. Their printing machine where they can print as much money as they want, they can get through royal commissions and get away with whatever they've done. They can destroy lives. They can destroy economies. They can buy their 15th yacht and you and I have to pick up the pieces from it. That is over. And that is why they will do everything in their power to say, oh no, this Bitcoin thing is bad. Just like the cigarette companies in the past said, no, nah, smoking's good for you. That's all right. You've got to trust us. Just like we can see that soft drinks and junk food companies say, oh, there's no fat in this. It's okay. It's packed with sugar and it's killing everyone. The same is true with the commercial entity that is the banking sector. The banking sector is saying, trust us. We've got your back. We know what we're doing. The history, the truth is, irrespective of what I say, I, I challenge every viewer out there, just go back in history. Are banks doing a good job? Are you richer now? Do you have more control? Do you have more independence? Or are you in fact more trapped now? Now we move into the digital currency, the CBDC. All a CBDC is, Martin, is a worse fiat. What is fiat? Fiat is the Latin word, it says by decree. It says that this money that is linked to nothing, that we keep printing, that we can have as much of it as we want, but you've got to work hard for it and we're going to erode your savings. That word fiat by decree means this fake money is what we have to accept because the government or someone says so. When it comes to a CBDC, all that a CBDC is, is a digitized version of fiat, and we're already using digital money anyway, so I've got no issue with digital money, but you want to think about the back end. Do you want an unlimited digital money where a bank can print, of it, print as much of it as they want, or do you want 
a digital hard money that is controlled by no one but open to everyone and you have complete control of. Now, CBDCs get even worse, Martin. Imagine the lockdown of the past when we had the, the flu, and I won't say the word in case it triggers the algorithm. They were blocking it. They were locking us down physically. You can't go past this border. You can't do this. Well, with a CBDC, they can lock you down economically. That means that if you live in Sydney and you want to go over to Brisbane, they can just literally put a hold on your money and say, no, Martin North, we told you that you've got to stay in that area. So when you go to buy a coffee in Queensland, because it's now programmable money, even though it's yours and it should be your sovereign right to own that money that you earn and you hold, they can just flick a switch in the background. They don't even need to block your bank account. They just turn off your money. They can also put expiry dates on your money. Therefore, they say, hey, Martin, you've earned $1,000 this month, but if you don't spend it in the next 30 days, that money will expire and they will absolutely do that. Why will they do that? Because it's a way of controlling the money supply. It's also a way of stimulating spending because if you don't spend, the money's going to expire. And if anyone cares about the environment, which many of us do and should care about, the issue with a money that goes down in value or expires is that it forces us to go out and buy landfill crap that destroys the earth. The irony with Bitcoin when people say, oh, it's bad for the environment. When I get a Bitcoin, I don't go out and blow it on Louis Vuitton handbags or a new car. I hold on to that thing. Why? Because next year it's worth more. And in 10 years, it's worth a way more. And in 20 years, it's worth even more again. So the irony of Bitcoin is that it actually reduces consumption. So when you look at a bank and they say, oh, we can't control this Bitcoin, we can't print it, we can't fractionally reserve lend it, that's really bad for us. Then you might look at a government and say, oh, hang on a second, we want economies to grow, we want to stimulate economies, and to do that we need people to spend. If people aren't spending their money, how's that going to look for the economy? Well, we're now in, we're all waking up. We're all waking up and saying, why do I have to waste my money on landfill junk? Why does my money go down in value every month? Why is it depreciating so quickly every year? Why is it that that entity there that is not a government, it's not a military, it's not a police, it's just a private entity, or you might even say a publicly listed, but in its essence, there's a boardroom full of directors who are on eight figures a year. Why do they get to print money, destroying my money, and they're protected by the government? But if I printed money, I would go to jail. That's not democracy. That's communism. When you have someone, no, that's not even fair to say, that's tyranny. When you have someone else who has different rules for them, the people at the top, they can print money and they can destroy your life. But if I print money, I go to jail. It's not fair, which is why it comes all the way back to what is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the essence of democracy. It levels the playing field for everyone. Whether you're the biggest player at the top of a bank, which we don't need in the future, or the CEO of a company, or a cleaner on eight Satoshis a minute, it makes us all even. And that, my friend, is something that we all have to ask ourselves. Do we want an even, fair, hard money? Or do we want a worse version of the corrupt, broken crap that we've got now? Yeah, and certainly the um, signs that I've seen, and I've read quite widely on the central bank digital currency initiatives, for example, the Federal Reserve published a paper and they said, well, actually, if we implement central bank digital currency, that will give us a set of additional monetary tools, right? Because as you say, you can set the interest rate, you can make money decay, you can control where it goes or what have you, right? You could do anything with it. Correct. And then if you look at um, the um, recent uh, stuff that the World Economic Forum and the United Nations were talking about, they were, they were saying, well, actually, it would be really good not just to have um, a domestic central bank digital currency, but actually having a global central bank digital currency would make so much sense as though that's somehow, that's somehow good. So you've got not only monetary policy tyranny, but potentially cross-border tyranny, right, being advocated by, by these groups. And the third thing, of course, and we see this if you take China as an example, the linkage of a central bank digital currency, which is essentially to do with, you know, to do with money, with digital ID, so that you can put the two together, which then gives you complete transparency in terms of what you're spending your money on, how you're spending your money. And of course, if you don't have the right social scores, then you can't do X, you can only do Y. So those three stools of effectively 
a next generation of tyranny is the concern I have about this whole thing. And I actually think that the crypto accidents that we're having at the moment is giving extra imperative and license to central banks saying, see, we always knew it was going to fail, right? You're you know, connecting the dots. This, You're connecting the dots. <laughs> this, this crypto stuff was, you know, a temporary thing, but we've got the real answer. Uh, uh, brilliant, Martin. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So it goes back to what I was talking about, scam, bankrupt, fraud, or Sam, <laughs> Sam Bankman freed. <laughs> it, it's a scam and it's a fraud. How is it that this rich kid, and if you look into his connections, there's a lot of connections he has with his family, his girlfriend. It's all really weird if you look at, when you look into it. We could talk about it for hours here. But ultimately, it links to exactly what you just said. You had this really rich kid who somehow got this really massive platform very quickly and was sponsoring a government to say, hey, no, we'll take care of it from here because crypto is broken. We need these regulations in here and we're going to have this global reserve CBDC. We've already got it. It's not a CBDC, though. We already have a global currency that works. It's called Bitcoin. The difference between a global currency that's Bitcoin that everyone can access and a global CBDC is that whoever's controlling that global CBDC, whether it's a nation, whether it's a bank, whether it's a World Economic Forum, which I think it is, they, they can print of it as much of it as they want. They can do whatever they want with it. It's, it's even better for them because now instead of having all of these small little banks, we'll just have, oh, we'll just have one global bank that we print all the money for the world. Now, arguably, you've already got that with the US dollar, but you can see that that's starting to break because, I, I won't say the word because it triggers the algorithm, the country that begins with R, they're doing their thing. China is doing their thing. India is starting to move away from it, and they're part of the Commonwealth. They're even saying, well, you know, we don't want the petrodollar anymore. You've got strong Arabic nations that are moving away from it. So the US dollar is done. It's done whether you want to say, well, they keep printing it so it's over, or it's an economic historical fact that all fiat's collapse, or we can see that in modern times, big nations are moving away from it. Sure, the US dollar is done. All fiat's are done. It's over. So what are we going to replace it with? Well, of course, those at the top, they want to replace it with their money. Why? Because they can print, of it, print of as much of it as they want. We already have a global currency that works, and it's called Bitcoin. And they, these banks, they absolutely hate it. They hate it because the, the gig is up. They can no longer print it all. They can no longer control it. But now governments are conflicted as well because governments are addicted to the ability to print money. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure governments, most of them are good people. I'm sure there's corrupt people everywhere. But ultimately, imagine being a government where in the past, if you wanted money, all you do is you print it. Now, of course, you don't do it. You go to a Federal Reserve and say, give us all this money and we'll give you an IOU. It's semantics, you know, it just the money just magically appears. But now if we dissolve the fake fiat money that is destroying lives everywhere, except for those at the very, very, and I'm not talking about the one percenters, I'm talking about the 0.01 percenters, they love it because they're getting as rich as they possibly can. Everyone else is falling to pieces. But if we now have a global reserve currency that everyone's on a level playing field, here's the irony of it also, Martin. Bitcoin is a money of peace, while fiat is a money of war. How do we make it sure that everyone uses fiat? Well, we say in a micro example, you say, if you don't use this money, we're going to send police, men with guns to your house, and we're going to lock you in a cage. That's, that's the fact. If you use fake money or you're avoiding tax, because you're using some type of other economy, men with guns will rock up your house and put you in a cage. Now let's extrapolate it to a macro scale. Let's say your name is Saddam Hussein, hypothetically, and you have decided that you no longer want to use the petrodollar. When you're buying and selling your oil, you say, no, I'm not going to use the US dollar anymore. I'm going to use my own currency. Well, guess what happens then? You can expect the war machine to rock up at your doorstep and take you out and blame you for weapons of mass destruction that were never there. Now, I'm not saying that, that actually happened. I'm saying, well, look at the history. You might like, well, look at Gaddafi as well. Anyone who says, I'm saying no to the US dollar or the petrodollar, which is one and the same, they can expect aircraft carriers at their doorstep with bombs falling out of the sky. But that gig is up now because you can't do You're going to do that to China. You're going to do that to the country that begins with R. Are you going to do that to India? No, you can't do that anymore. On the micro scale, sure, you can still send men with guns around to your house and say you are using the wrong currency. But it's kind of weird now because now we do have digital assets where we can use it. So if governments would actually focus more on adopting Bitcoin, 
and the opportunities it creates just as the internet of knowledge created, they could in fact wind back the war machine considerably, which costs a lot of money and is really bad for the environment. And we could in fact focus on a money of peace instead of a money of war. And so what is interesting when we look at CBDCs, and we, we spoke about this, uh, I think about six months ago, hmm. you said, well, Adam, I put it to, and I still remember clearly because it, it was a very striking comment. You said, Adam, I put it to you that governments are going to introduce a CBDC. And I said to you, I said, of course they are, because they're already using fiat, but they, they just want a more efficient form of fiat with more control. But then you say, right, well, if, if China has a CBDC and Australia has a CBDC, but someone in England is selling Lamborghinis, I'll just make something up, and they say, this Lamborghini is for sale, and China says, oh, we'll give you a million Chinese CBDCs. And they're like, oh, okay, Australia, what have you got? And we say, oh, we'll give you 2 million Australian CBDCs. But then someone over in New Zealand has, says, hey, England, I'll give you three Bitcoin. Well, which one's more valuable? Just go to scarcity. Which one is unlimited? The Chinese one is unlimited. The Australian one is unlimited. But Bitcoin's not unlimited. So now you have to say, and this is why you made the good connection before, you said, there has to be a global CBDC. There has to be. Because if there's a global reserve currency at the moment, which is a US dollar that's backed up by a war machine, and that model is broken, which it is, and we're now moving into a CBDC, well, now you've got this issue where you've got all of these countries with unlimited money, which is just fiat, even though it's in a digital form, it makes no difference. It's unlimited programmable money. And noting that the, the power that they can put on it. So you know, in that Lamborghini example, England goes, all right, Australia, I'll accept your $2 million CBDCs. We send them over to England, we get our Lamborghini, but then Australia goes, ah, ha, ha, I tricked you, and they turn your money off. Th that's possible with CBDCs, but if, if they accepted the three Bitcoin from New Zealand, that money can't be turned off. So within a, an economy, a local economy, a domestic economy, sure, men with guns can come around to your house and say, you'll use this money or we'll put you in jail. But on a global stage, which we are all on in the global village, you can't make me accept your CBDC when someone over there is offering me Bitcoin, unless you go to war. But then you go back to the situation where at the, at the moment, fiat is a money of war, whilst Bitcoin is a money of peace. So ultimately, do we want a money of war or do we want a money of peace? Do we want a scarce hard money or do we want an unlimited corruptible money? It, the choice is just so blatantly obvious to me, but the reason why it's so difficult to grasp is because again, we have never ever had a money like this in the history of humanity. Right, well, let's um, just explore the central bank digital currency slightly further. And to do that, I want to put this up. This is actually the white paper on CBDC research from the Reserve Bank, it's published on the 26th of September, right? Because the Reserve Bank is collaborating with an entity called the Digital Finance Cooperative Research Center, the DFCRC, right? And it's a research project to explore use cases for a central bank digital currency in Australia. Now, the reason this is quite interesting is because originally the Australian context was this, that the Reserve Bank in Australia didn't see that there was going to be any need for a retail central bank digital currency. They were putting all their eggs in a wholesale digital currency, which basically is for corporate settlement and, you know, those sorts of things, right? So there was a Treasury review, and that Treasury review said, no, 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 we should be thinking about a retail central bank digital currency. This is why, why this was spawned. So they're running this pilot at the moment, right? And this DFCRC entity, right, which is a collection of universities and other commercial entities that, you know, I've been around for a little while and, and are regarded by the Reserve Bank as the experts, right? So they're now essentially looking at the different use cases for a central bank digital currency in Australia. And they're currently running. And they're looking at various pilot projects and test cases. It's based on the Ethereum platform. And the other interesting observation about this is that if you actually then go digging to say, well, so who is this digital research cooperative, right? It's a 10-year, $180 million research program funded by industry partners, universities, the Australian government through the Cooperative Research Centres program. Um, this is 
a whole bunch of industry bodies with vested interests, universities with vested interests, and the Australian government with vested interests. So what we've actually got is the Reserve Bank partnering with a whole bunch of vested interests to do a central bank digital currency pilot. Now, I've seen almost no discussion about this entity and the structure of this entity and how, what, ag what agenda is it driving. And I think that's a big problem. Of course it is. It's all corrupt. L let's keep it simple. L what do they stand to gain from us adopting their money instead of the people's money? Well, they stand to gain unlimited money and unlimited profits and all the freedom in the world. What do we stand to gain if we use our money? Freedom. So I, I know this sounds quite you know in your face, like, well, hang on, we're Australia, we're free. Well, we're not free when our money erodes by inflation at the moment is 20%. Uh, don't worry about the official CPI rates. I put it out there to the people. You tell me how much your coffee has gone up. You tell me how much your fuel has gone up, how much your rent has gone up, how much your electricity, your food, your water. That's, the, that's inflation. It's not the CPI basket that is constantly changing to say, well, your Netflix didn't go up that much, so that's okay. And your mobile phone didn't go up that much. In fact, that went down because there's some really compete, competitive digital deals out there. The real rate of inflation is what we feel, what we experience and how much we work so much harder to get so much less. Now, again, keeping it simple, I just say, what's the supply? Just keep it real simple. What's the supply of fiat? Unlimited. What's the supply of a CBDC? No matter what name you put on it, you can put call it a, a GBDC or an FPDC. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's unlimited. And when you have an unlimited supply of money, it's destined to fail. That's not my rule. That's the rule of mathematics and thermodynamics and economics. So no matter what spin we put on a CBDC, who researches it, what we want to, what laws we want to put around it, all of it is fake, unlimited fiat in a more efficient form for those at the top. We already have the technology now to do what we need to do, which is have a global reserve currency that is completely fair, open, neutral, borderless, and censorship resistant. That is Bitcoin. The question that we now need to be asking is, is money a function of government? Is it meant to be a function of government? Was money ever a function of government? Well, no, it wasn't. But somehow we came into making, accepting, for, for whatever reason, that money was a function of government and we disguised it by saying, well, no, actually, it's a function of banks because they're printing it, whether it's a retail bank or a Federal Reserve Bank, which is, again, neither a federal entity nor has any reserves. So they kind of delinked it. So all of us who don't know nothing about money is like, Oh, the money comes from the banks. No, the money comes from government. No, it doesn't come from either. But of course, Banks get all the profits from it. Governments get free money. Both of them protect one another because one is supplying one with the drug and the other one is protecting them by law so they can supply the drug. Meanwhile, all of us in the population are getting financially destroyed with inflation and we're losing more liberties and more freedoms, the freedom of association, the freedom of privacy. Our, our journey began, Martin, together with the cash ban. Yep. Now, why is the cash ban so important to stand up against? It's because freedom of privacy is part of democracy when you go to vote and they put you in a little booth where no one can see your vote that is crucial and fundamental to democracy it stops you being bullied or coerced into voting for someone that you don't want to vote for when we look at a cbdc or a digital currency that someone can track see monitor which i argue we can already do now because everything's gone digital everyone's using a bank which is stored by a centralized body which has full access to everything that you're doing, you lose your privacy. Now, being private doesn't make you a terrorist. Being private doesn't make you illegal. It makes you a free person. When you lose your privacy, think of it in the essence when you go to a prison cell and you're locked up in jail, not that I've ever been, I hope I never go, but you have no privacy there. Your toilet is out there for everyone to see. It, it, the purest form of losing your freedom, if you will, you have no privacy when you're in a cage exposed to everyone around you. At the other end of the spectrum, privacy includes being able to shut the door when you go to the bathroom or have a shower, not because you're a terrorist, not because you're a criminal, but because as free human beings, we have a right to privacy. 
why don't we have a right to financial privacy? The throwaway line is terrorism. Well, guess what? That's what we've got police and militaries and FBI's and CIA's. That's what their function is to treat us all as terrorists and take away our right to sovereignty, privacy and freedom because there's a few bad people in the world. But those who are at the very top, arguably, they're the worst people in the world because they're destroying everyone above them for the sake of freedom or their, their safety and their freedom, but not our freedom and not our safety. Because if we lose our privacy and we vote for the wrong person in the day, we already saw it with Canada, whether you like the truckies thing or not. So if you remember during the pandemic, truckies in Canada had a protest. Now, it doesn't matter if you're for or against it. Step aside from that. What's important is that that was a democratic nation and people who donated to those truckies so they could buy some bread and food and water, they weren't giving them bombs and bullets and guns and plans to destroy a nation. They were giving them food and water because they were supporting a political cause. And guess what happened to them? They were shut down. They were shut out of the financial system. That was a real eye opener to the world to say, that's a democratic nation. They were having a democratic process of the freedom of voting and the freedom of association and the freedom to assemble and the freedom, the freedom to protest. Well, guess what happened to those people? You throw a CBDC on this, man, we are no longer free. We're, we're already losing our freedom now. And the real question going right back to the beginning of this long rant, Martin, is why is money a function of government? It was never a function of government, but for whatever reason, we've now said, okay, it's a function of government that's profiting the banks, which is protected by the government at the cost of all of us. Yeah, and you've got to ask how well central banks have done in their battle against inflation or um, you know, their reaction to the global financial crisis back in 2008, um, how great the economy has been since then. So I would argue that those um, central bankers have actually been part of the problem rather than being part of the solution. Look at how they're trying to stop. I'm sorry to interject, but no. you raise a really good important. Mm. How are they trying to stop inflation right now? I tell you how they're trying to stop inflation by punishing you and me. Correct. So they, I mean, this is the irony of it. And, and please, everyone, think about it. They keep printing this money. You're, you're losing money because they keep devaluing your money by printing more of it. And so to fix the mess, they say, I know what we'll do. We'll charge these innocent bystanders more money by putting all the interest rates up oh, and we'll make everything more expensive. I mean, are you kidding me? That, that's literally what we've done. We've literally said, you over there can print all the money. You can create all the inflation. And when it all falls to pieces, you can either bail yourself out with our taxes. You can bail yourselves back in with our savings, or you can just financially destroy us by putting the interest rates up so we can no longer pay for our mortgages, mortgages, food, electricity, and water. And the people are saying, oh, yeah, let's give this power to the banks. Why? Why would you give this power to the banks who keep breaking the system? We have a solution. It's sitting in front of us. And for everyone who goes, oh, but this with Bitcoin, that with Bitcoin, God, it's not perfect. And I'm not saying Bitcoin is perfect, but I tell you this, it's way better than fiat. And it's even more better if it's such a, it's even better again than a, a CBDC. So sure, I acknowledge that Bitcoin is not perfect, but it is by far the most perfect money or closest to perfect that we've had ever in the history of humanity. Yeah, and just on this um, central bank shim model, right, there was a very interesting interplay between the RBA and Senate uh, in Senate estimates last week. And I actually put a few posts, go and check them out on my channel. But the one from Nick McKim and the Greens was trying to get the RBA to explain why it is that they think the lever they're pulling is the right lever to pull. And he basically accused them of, um, you know, essentially hurting people and hurting businesses with their policy of reducing demand, right? And in fact, I spoke to another senator the other day, um, Joe Rennick, and he made the point, look, rather than actually trying to shrink demand, what about investing to create more supply so that you can get the balance the other way? So there's a, there's a, there's a myopia in central banks about this interest rate lever that they got to pull, never mind the consequences. And they admitted that some people are going to be very significantly badly impacted by what they're doing, right? And then I want to come back to what I said. And the Federal Reserve said, 
We need more monetary policy tools, and central bank digital currencies gives us a whole bunch of new tools, right? Um, that's why I'm, you know, I'm very concerned about this whole central bank digital currency story, because a lot of people, I think, are not fully understanding what the implications could be. Because they don't understand money. Well, we, yeah, we ma weren't taught yeah. money. No, that's true. Yeah. It, I mean, think about it. I mean, I have one of my degrees is in is in economics, mm. and I did not understand money until I got into Bitcoin. And I'm I should be one of the most qualified people, certainly the top percentage of the world who understands money. I've got formal qualifications in in money, and I didn't even understand how this this scam was working. Now, going back to what you're saying about you know, let's put up interest rates. I mean, imagine being a bank. You're, you're at the top. You're lending out money that you never had. You were operating in market failure. You're getting money back on an investment, on a loan for something that you never had in the first place. And you're charging interest on that loan. And then when it all goes to pieces, guess what your reward is? You get paid more for the mess that you just made by saying, okay, let's pull this economic lever to slow the economy down yep. by charging all the battlers out there who had no control over their money in the first instance and make them pay more for the same thing that they were getting. So, I mean, let's just look at a mortgage. Most people, well, not most, but a lot of people have got a mortgage. They've done nothing wrong. They're going to work. They're working hard. They're, they're making their payments. Banks were lending out money that they never had. We got into the mess we've got at the moment. So what happens? Okay, all you mums and dads, guess what? We're doubling the amount of money you owe us. Why? Oh, because of inflation. Well, what happened with inflation? Oh, we printed too much money, so you have to pay us. Yep. So guess what? The banks have already put out the loans that, of money that they never had. So if, if an economy is moving well and they're loaning out heaps of money, guess what? Lots of loans are out there, lots of money coming in, yay. Even though the interest rate's low, we now have a huge uh, pool of loans out there that are giving us money. Now let's invert the economy. The economy is going bad because inflation is bad. Well, guess what? You may not be lending out as much money, but because... Oh, sorry, Adam, you've just cut off. I, I got you there. Sorry, yeah. I just hit my space bar. So you, you're now lending out either less money or the same amount of money, but you're getting paid twice as much for that money because of the mess that you made in the first place. If any other entity was doing this, they would be put in jail. <laughs> if there was any organization that was printing fake money and then destroying an economy and then making mum and dad pay for the mess that they made, they would be put in jail. But for some reason, for some absurd reason, we're like, okay, now this is how it works. Oh, and by the way, let's give them more power. Let's give them a CBDC. I've served this country in, in many ways. And you might say in uniform, you might say through community service, and you might say through tax. But my main mission now, Martin, it's for everyone to wake up and say, you don't need to like me, but why are you liking the banks? Why do you want to put this power in the bank's hands? What have they done for you lately? How is it turning out for everyone except for those on the boards of the banks? Are we better off with the banks in the medium to short term? Sure, I can see how it works, but look at where we're ended up now. And do you want to just repeat this process or do you want to use something new? We, we have a solution. The solution is for all of us and it's free and it works and it's ready to go. And the only people who don't want to use it, there's two. One, those who don't understand it, which is the majority because we are not taught about money. And two, those who absolutely understand it, they know the jig is up. They've lost their monopoly. They want to stop this thing with everything they've got. Everyone else, they're like, yeah, bring on Bitcoin or bring on some other coin. And even if you say it's not Bitcoin, if you show me a better solution to fiat, I don't care what it is, I'll accept it. But having lived in this space for, well, years now and being so passionate about it, my mission is to protect my fellow Australians and global citizens to say, I don't care who you are, what you look like, what language you speak, what you believe in, the fundamentals to everything we do, whether we like it or not, is money. Why? Because you need money to live. Even if you're a charity and you say, well, no, our, the fundamentals of what we do is helping other people. Well, how do you help other people? You need money. Even if you say, I'm an ambulance service and we're out there to rescue people, got it. You need ambulances. Everything is money. Whether you like it or not, it's the foundation to everything we do. So if we want to fix all of these problems, whether it's the environment, corruption, world peace, whatever it is, the fundamentals to all of it 
is money. And if we have a toxic, broken, corrupt financial system, which is fiat and what we've got now, or an even worse system of tyranny, which is a CBDC, which is possibly about to come in, we have an opportunity to fix it and we need to take that opportunity now. Yeah, well, I certainly don't think the central banks have been part of the solution. They've been part of the problem. And uh, as you made the point, and I just want to re-emphasize it, they created the inflation problem in the first place by taking interest it. rates ultra low, all the stimulus, and of course the government stimulus too. The reason we have inflation is not just supply chain disruptions and you know the convenient uh, conflict excuse. It was created by bad central bank policy over a number of years. And now they're looking for more tools to try and actually continue and perpetuate their their tyranny and i have a problem with that i have a big problem with it so and so you should <laughs> now i've got this question for you which is a bit of a compound question and i want to say um thanks very much for uh jason for the super chat and i'm going to read it off the other screen because it's fallen off the end so does adam believe that only two coins bitcoin and litecoin are the only crypto coins that will prevail why no others and do you hold others or are you just doing those two? And do you think that Bitcoin will avoid the ISO 20022, which is a function of government and law, which happens? Okay, so um, it, easily answered. Uh, I, d I do not believe and did not say that only two coins will uh, prevail. There are many coins that will work because there's more than... I, I said that Bitcoin and Litecoin are the only true cryptocurrencies. There will be many coins, just as there are already many different types of money. We have different types of fiats. We have frequent flyer points, Woolworth points, gift cards, credit card points, uh, movie tickets, bus passes, the beer economy. These are all types of money. I believe in democracy. So if you and I do business and you want Dogecoin, I'll pay you in Dogecoin. If you do business with me, I want Bitcoin. Why? Because that's freedom. Now, that's not avoiding tax. If there's a value there, I will pay my cut to the tax man. But if I value Litecoin and you value the Dogecoin and that person values Shibu Inu, that's cool. Now, when we go into something like Ethereum, Ethereum is like the digital oil of the global space. Ethereum or its competitor, you might look at Algorand, Cardano, Pulse. There's many different coins that are competing with Ethereum, they will absolutely exist. We absolutely need those coins and they will absolutely have a value. When I'm talking about one coin prevailing as a global reserve currency, absolutely that's where I believe it's Bitcoin. Why? Because it's fair. Now we, this links in fairly to the question about the ISO 2022 standards. But what is that standard? I'll tell you what that standard is. That is a man-made centralized standard saying, we're in charge, you got to use this money which goes back to the whole thing that we've been talking about today. Who writes the ISO 2022 standard? And why are they the police? Why do they say we have to use their money? Well, I'll tell you why. It goes the same reason why they say we have to use the petrodollar, which is a US dollar, as a global reserve currency. Because if you don't, you'll get aircraft carriers on your doorstep. So you tell me, and I'm, I don't mean to be aggressive here. It's, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. You tell me, who's going to enforce the I02022 document? Who is the power behind that that says, we are the world police and we have decided that of all the people in the world and all the money in the world, this document here that says ISO, International Standards, we choose the money that you're going to use. I mean, really answer that question. Who makes that call? And I tell you who makes that call. The person who's got the biggest bombs and aircraft carriers, which links to what I've been saying. That document is a money of violence because they're saying, if you don't use this this money that we say is is allowed and legal, then we'll send men to your house with guns or aircraft carriers to your shores with bombs. And th that's how you enforce those documents. That's how you enforce the petrodollar. So why is it that whoever wrote that standard, why do we have to accept that? And you really have to say, yeah, why can't I use my own money? And if you say, well, it's about avoiding tax. No, it's not. You can see Bitcoin. You can see the transactions. You can see everything that happens. And I can tell you right now, Australia, I am definitely paying my fair share of tax. Believe me, I'm paying more tax now than I have in years of being in this country. And all I'm doing is working in the crypto space. So the tax man is getting more money from me now working in crypto 
than before I was working in crypto. So it's not about avoiding tax. The real question is, why do we have to use that money? Why can't we use our money? And when it, uh, just to loop back to what you said before, no, th there are many cryptocurrencies, many will work, and I believe in the free market. And if you want to use Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, Cardano, whatever coin, I support it entirely. As long as we can see it, the tax man gets his cut. We have to accept that. I know taxes are seen as, as criminal by some people, but ultimately we need a military. We need police forces. We need roads. We need lighting. We need emergency services. We need schools. We need hospitals. And all of those things cost money. But when you print money to make those things, what actually happens is everything becomes more expensive. So let's use a hard money or multiple different monies. We'll take our fair and reasonable portion of tax to run the economy. And then instead of having tax offices that are so massive and so com complicated that you need multiple accountants to do a tax return, where well, we now have the power with uh, a Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies or multiple cryptocurrencies to use a platform and just go tax return. And because it's all digital, without any confusion, it just prints it up straight away. That's the opportunities we now have with these digital currencies. Yeah, very, very um, interesting. Jason just put up another comment there, which I won't read out, but you can read it on the screen for those who are interested. Um, so we're sort of coming to the last um, 10 minutes of the, of, of the show, and there are a couple of things I just wanted to, to sort of close towards. The first is knowing what you know now and knowing how governments are behaving and the current state of play, how do you actually think the next couple of years are actually going to play out? Are we going to see more crypto downside? Are we going to see other failures, other exchanges going to fail? Are we going to see um, some of the big end of town pull back from crypto because of what's happened recently? Um, how, how do you think this is going to play out? Uh, I think you will see more exchanges go down because uh, when people are involved, businesses fail. If you just look at any stock market, uh, millions upon millions upon millions of companies fail whether they're financial companies or other companies they fail so that's part of that's part of the life and that's part of the free market I've, I've got no issue with that bitcoin won't break bitcoin's proven itself and it can't fail because it's been hacked or at least attempted to be hacked for years many people have tried to destroy it and it just keeps getting stronger and stronger moreover we have massive powerful companies world leading companies they're not pulling away from this technology they're investing in it you can even see companies such as instagram they're turning their images and i said this would happen years ago and it, it, it has happened now you can now quite comfortably and it's still transitioning but you can take an image off instagram transfer it into an nft which is a rare digital asset and sell it and everything will be an NFT, which is linked to this whole ecosystem, whether it's a land title, a birth certificate, a driver's license, a picture, a video, whatever. NFTs make perfect sense. So when it comes to the technology of the internet of money and everything we can build on this, this is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And even when you can see a massive pullback like this, everything in the background, people aren't pulling out of this. When you look at it as a financial market, sure, it's, it's a when things are treated like a financial market, just the same as with housing, the housing market should be a housing market to live in, but it's, it's been monetized. And that's where we can see the, the kind of mess with the housing market. The same is true with the crypto markets. And some of those coins out there are absolutely scams. Most of them will fail, but there will be many coins, but there will be one that's at the top. And that one at the top, in my opinion, and after 13 years of history, it will always be Bitcoin for reasons that we've explained. When we go into what's happening around the world, my prediction is war is coming. I've been saying this, unfortunately, for two years. Why is it coming? Historically, we're due for war. But ultimately, when you have a depression, conflict starts within ourselves. We are nine meals away from chaos. Nine meals. Don't believe me? You go nine meals and see how you feel, and then throw in a wife or children or husband and kids and mums and dads and dogs and cats and those who you love and want to protect. We are nine meals away from complete chaos. And that's just internally. Then you look at the global stage, what's going to happen when the US dollar collapses? And if you say, well, Adam, he's crazy, the US dollar is not going to collapse. Okay, well, how are you going to make China, India, and the country that begins with R, how are you going to make them use the US dollar, which is the petrodollar and one and the same? And if the US dollar is no longer the petrodollar, then there's no more demand, supply and demand 101. They keep putting up the supply of the US dollar, but the demand drops. When the supply increases or remains constant and the demand drops, what happens to the price or the purchasing power? It plummets, and that's already begun. 
They're printing more of the US dollar. And you might say, well, some of the demand is also going up. No. When, when you're pulling out of the petrodollar, the main demand on the US dollar is the petrodollar and the SWIFT network. And both are, de are, are dead, basically. Why? Because we've pushed that country that begins with R out of the petrodollar system, but they're still selling their oil, but they're not just not using the US dollar. So, you know, was that a plan? Was it, is Putin dumb? Is he good? Probably not. Is he dumb? I really don't think so. What's happened to the ruble is it's gone up in value. Why? Because now he can sell his oil without using the petrodollar. So that's an example. China's doing the same. And India, they're also quite comfortable using either the, the yuan or the ruble or their own currency to buy and sell oil. So straight away, that's a massive demand on the US dollar that's dropping down. So even you say, All right, well, we're going to make them use the US dollar. How? How do you make someone use the US dollar? With war. How do you make anyone use any currency? With violence. So that's one demand of the US dollar going down. Now let's talk about the second drop of the US dollar. Swift network. In the past, if I wanted to send $10 from Australia to London or England, I had to go. Essentially, what was happening in the background was that money somewhere along the way, I wasn't sending Australian dollars to England. I was sending Australian dollars into the SWIFT network, which was converted to the US dollar, which was putting a demand on the US dollar. And then it was going over to England and then converting into the British pound sterling. What does that mean? That means for every global financial transaction, it needed the US dollar. And it also means combined with the petrodollar, every single global financial transaction that involved oil, when, when you understand logistics and supply chains, look around everything in your room, everything in your building, in your house, everything, all of it came to you via oil because it needed energy to either be produced or moved. And noting nearly all of that oil had to somehow go through the petrodollar, which is the US dollar, it created a demand on it. So there's two massive demands that are about, and primary demands that are about to drop off the US dollar, the petrodollar and the SWIFT network. And it's not, oh, it could happen, it is happening right now. So as they print more US dollars, you now have this catastrophic failure of supply going up and demand going down, therefore the price is catastrophically falling. Now, what do you do when you run out of money and someone else wants to be the global reserve currency and you've got people using a different SWIFT network, so you've lost control over doing these, these blocks of money because now we have cryptocurrencies that can move money around the world, whether it's Bitcoin, a stable coin or whatever coin, the technology exists. Whether we like it or not, just the same as we can send information around with the internet instead of ships or carrier pigeons, we can now send money and information at the speed of light, arguably, digitally for almost free. So that changes the dynamics of everything. So ultimately, I'm sorry to say this, but war is coming. Now, whether that war is a traditional war with lots of bombs and bullets or a cyber war or a war of economics, it's already begun. And what is the outcome of it? Hopefully, we can come together and say, right, no matter what colour you are, no matter what language you speak, no matter what army or navy you have behind you, let's accept that we all use money. Now, the question is, will the world leaders have the integrity and courage to sit around and say, right, I want to be the global reserve currency, but I acknowledge that you don't want me to be the global reserve currency because it's not fair. It's not fair that I can print all the money and you have to create real value for me to produce fake money and I can swap my fake money for your real value. Equally, I don't want you to have that power and I don't want you to have that power. So they're probably all going to figuratively or literally sit around a table and say, right, we all want to be the global reserve currency. And they're either going to have this discussion before or after a war. If they're doing the right thing, they're going to do it before a war because they're going to say, yeah, we've got mad, mutually assured destruction. So no one can really win this war. So rather than slaughtering thousands of people and destroying the environment, how about we figure out a real money? Now, if there is a centralized global power like the WEF or someone that I don't know, and I know I don't know, if they somehow have the power to say, our ISO 20022 is the global power document that says this is the money, if they can do that without violence and we can all agree to a hard money, great. But how do you instill that document? So ultimately, hopefully world leaders will come together and say, right, we're at a stalemate. We've all got the ability to make fake money. We've all got the ability to nuke one another. How about we don't print fake money and we don't nuke each other? How about we just use a neutral, borderless, 
censorship resistant and immutable money that's existing already has proven itself is available to everyone is free to use is a hard money let's tap into that i hope for the latter but i fear for the former yeah thank you well it's certainly um when you when you when you go through the sort of the logic and say you know there are a lot of uncertainties and a number of people are saying that the level of uncertainty globally at the moment is higher than it's been for a long long time um, it seems to me that the existing financial parameters that have been used by central banks have actually been part of the problem. Um, I, I'm less convinced than you are that the solution is a crypto solution, but I know that what we've currently got is not fit for purpose. That's quite clear. And I know that there are a number of entities arguing for an extension of the current stuff that doesn't work on the assumption that if you give us a bit more of it, well, then we can make it work this time. And I think that's completely naive and, frankly, a bit stupid, not to say disingenuous. And I also make the point that if you th watch this carefully, there is this sort of top-down sort of thinking coming through from you know, the likes of the World Economic Forum and the UN and those things. And, in fact, I've spoken to a number of politicians in the last couple of months saying, but... They're, this is what they're this is what they're saying, and you know clearly we should listen to what they say because they must know what they're doing. Um, interesting philosophy of they must know what they're doing, right? And we should just cow how and say, yeah, that's fine. I have a problem with that, right? So I'm I'm a much more interested in democratization and the bottom up and community based and all those things which is a billion miles from where things currently are and i guess my sort of take out from this is if in fact a form of uh crypto can enable and help that then maybe it does have a place but i'm just thinking we have a billion miles from where we need to be to be able to actually make some of this work and i worry that they're going to break something on the way through as you say there's um I'm going to share a comment from, uh, for the views out there who don't know, Martin and I have worked together for probably a couple of years. You come on my channel, I come on your channel, and we are from different camps and we enjoy speaking with one another. I'm speaking on your behalf here, Martin, is because we're open to hear both sides of the story. We're open to learn what's happened. So when I first met you, you the way you looked at Bitcoin and crypto was completely different to the way that you look at it now. And what was interesting in one of our interest, uh, earlier videos is that one, <laughs> one of my subs said, so let, and, and he was a good guy, said, so don't take this personally, but he said, so let me get this straight. Martin North wants a money that looks like Bitcoin, acts like Bitcoin, and has the freedom of Bitcoin, but is not Bitcoin. And I think that's, sub <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think that summarizes the paradigm for many people, and, and I don't mean it as a personal mm. dig. What I mean by that is, first of all, the comment was real. And it, it, was, it was said over a year ago, but it always sticks in my head because you know what? You're in the more traditional financial sector. You have a lot of uh, economic, financial, and philosophical experience. And I look to you for guidance uh, from one of my wiser elders in the community, if you will. But when we're coming up with a solution, what you represent is the majority and what i represent is the minority because there's more people who see your paradigm and i understand it and i've got no issue with it than see my paradigm but ultimately when i when i explain this to to people and i and i really do this as a thought experiment to everyone it's like okay what would make a good money and, and what i say to what would make a good money is first of all it must be finite if it's infinite or infinite What's the point? You know, if, if we have an infinite money, so you might talk about store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account. I, I just bring it right back, even before you get into that. The, the essence of a money that works is that it must have a fixed supply. So, number one, it's got to have a fixed supply. And even you say, no, 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 we've got to keep printing it. Why? Says who? Because if you don't keep printing it, what actually happens is things start going down in value. And hang on, let me explain, reiterate that. Things start going down in price. Instead of everything going up in price, things start going down in price. So you might have less money, but then you need less money to buy more stuff, which is the opposite of what we had at the moment. We, we actually need more money now to buy even less stuff because money is worth less, but everything's more expensive. So we're in the worst of both worlds. But if you had a finite supply, you would be in fact in a position where prices 
would eventually start going down because that money would become scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, which leads to the second part of money. Money must be divisible. If you say we're going to use gold and everything is getting cheaper and cheaper because gold is getting more and more scarce because more and more people are using it and there's only, only two Olympic sized swimming pools of gold. Well, then it gets to a point that we have to shave a piece of gold off that is one thousandth the size of a piece of a dust. And we can't do that with, in a physical form. You can do that in a digital form. So number one, money must be finite if it wants to work. Number two, it must be divisible, both of which is Bitcoin. It's finite and it's divisible. The second part is it must be mobile. We must be able to move it. Now, whether that's from you to me, looking at each other, or sending money from me to someone in Amazon, it must be mobile. And that's what Bitcoin is. And then the next part is it must be secure because if it's not secure and it's easily hacked or broken or replicated or, or falsified, then it undoes the last three components of it. So I could go on, and I note that we're going to the end of the show, but I really encourage you to do all your thought experiments. Don't worry about Bitcoin. Don't worry about fiat. Don't worry about gold. Think about what, what would make a good money. And once you actually start going through the thought processes, what, what would actually make a good money? The answer is actually Bitcoin. You, it'll take you a while to go through all the, and, and And if, I, I give you my word, I say this publicly live on the global stage, Martin North, if you legitimately go through those thought processes and you legitimately come up with a better money, I'm all in, brother. But until you can do that or anyone on planet Earth can do that, all we've got at the moment that is legitimately the best money that we've got for everyone, except for the banks, is Bitcoin. I'm going for seashells. <laughs> <laughs> Not infinitely divisible and I can't move them. No, indeed. Adam, thank you very much. Um, I think that was a very interesting conversation. I know a few people in the chat got a bit frustrated with some of it, but the point is this is a really important conversation and it comes fundamentally back to what is money. Now, I did actually put a poll up. And I basically said, in three years' time, who will win out? Central bank digital currency, crypto, including Bitcoin, both will coexist, neither will exist. And we've got the answer with 30% central bank digital currency, 15% crypto, including Bitcoin, 39% both coexist, and 16% neither will exist. So there you go. That was what the, uh, that's what the audience thinks. <laughs> Fascinating. I'd be fascinating to, uh, fascinated to know what if neither exists, what do we have? Yes. Um, and and I, I'm genuinely interested if we don't have either. I, I think it's more likely, in my opinion, if, in case you're wondering, I think I would go with the majority. I think both will exist. Um, but I don't think uh, the last option of n neither will exist. I, I don't think that's feasible at all. <laughs> <laughs> but then what well, do we got? <laughs> well, there you go, I was going to say. And yeah. um, if people want to find out more about you and what you do, or where do they go? Thank you for asking. So uh, check out my book, 28 Pro Trader Tips, The Art of Trading. That is on Amazon. Come over to my channel, Adam Stokes. If you want to do anything crypto safely, head over to thecrypto.land. That's www.thecrypto.land. Or follow me on Twitter at uh, handle at Adam underscore Stokesy, S-T-O-K-E-S-Y. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. I look forward to picking up the conversation down the track as and normal. Um, thank you. I'm going to take you offline. I'm going to close the show. Thank you, Martin. So, yeah. So there you go. Um, interesting conversation, as always. You can always know that Adam is going to come out fighting and uh, making some really, really good points. So thanks, Adam, for that. Just to say that uh, next week we're going to switch over and talk property. I've got Veronica Morgan coming on. I want to talk specifically about the property dynamics over the last couple of months with what she's seeing. And so that should be a uh, worthwhile make a diary note to join us next Tuesday and uh, in the meantime of course I'll be putting up shows through the week and uh, they will always be available so I'll go and have a look at some of those the one I did with Senator Rennick yesterday specifically on this political debate um, I do recommend it that was quite a quite a powerful I think quite a quite a powerful show so thank you very much to everybody for hanging in and getting us to the end of the show thanks for your comments and uh, have a good evening Take care, and I'll see you next week. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, signing off. Cheerio.